morning, Columbia United Methodist Church. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I bid you a warm welcome to this time of worship. On this first Sunday of Advent, and it is all right, can you believe it, the first Sunday of Advent. On this Sunday, I remind us to place our hope in our Lord, Jesus, who is the true light, the Prince of Peace. I invite you to take uh, some time to read through your bulletin inserts for announcements of all kinds. Um, I will look up a few as reminders because some of the things are coming up soon. Next Sunday is the Father and Child Men's Breakfast event, so if you are planning to come and bring a guest, please either email Bob, his email address is included in the announcement in the bulletin, or there's a sign up sheet in the lobby that you can um, also use to indicate that you are coming and how many. So please don't forget to do that, and please do plan to join uh, the men's breakfast at 8.30 next week. Also, next week is our due date for poinsettia orders. So if you are planning to order a poinsettia plant, the order forms, again, are in the lobby. There's a little box that you can use to place your orders inside. Please make sure to get those in by next Sunday as well because we have to order them a little earlier than usual, I believe, so that way we can make sure that we can have your poinsettias that you would like um, in the sanctuary. The admin study starts this week as well. Uh, there will be two options for you. You can either come on Tuesdays at noon, or um, if you prefer, you can come on Wednesdays at 7.30, right after youth club is um, concluded. So um, choose whatever time works for you. It's going to be a very interesting study by Andy Sten called Who Needs Christmas? And I think it will be really interesting. So if you're interested, um, you don't have to sign up or anything, just come. And um, we will have a marvelous time exploring what uh, Reverend Stanley has to say about Advent. But now, friends, I invite you to quiet your hearts and your minds as we prepare for this time of worship with silent prayer.
provider. And um, you'll notice in your bulletin on the facing page, your um, the liturgy is printed there for you so that you will be able to participate and the liturgist will prompt you when it is time. But um, you'll also notice that at the bottom, after the the lighting of the candle is concluded and the prayer is concluded, there's a part for you to sing along. Now, you don't know this song maybe at first, but if you'll have an opportunity to sing it twice in the choir. Again, we'll have to lead that. And I promise you that by Christmas Eve, you will be singing this song as you leave the sanctuary. So um, we are very um, happy to be able to present this very special Advent liturgy. I invite our choir to take their place and our liturgists to come forward, and, and then we will begin.
I need as I turn on my microphone. Will you please join me now in the words to the opening prayer? God of hope, how often have we found ourselves in exile, separated from your presence? Restore us and let us find you when we seek you. Amen. And now, friends, please stand in body or in spirit to join me as we sing our opening hymn, People Look Peace, hymn number 202.
Spirit with me. Holy God, you have given us more than we could have imagined. Make of us and of these gifts an offering of good news to the poor, hope to the hopeless, and signs of your power to reconcile and redeem. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You may be seated. Then will you pray with me? Eternal God, we see your power in mighty deeds and tender mercies. We see your watchful care in places of exile and at home. We feel your healing presence both in sickness and in our brokenness. On this day, O oh Lord, we pray for the world and its people. We especially pray for an end to oppression and injustice in all their forms. We pray for an end to violence. We lift up to you the citizens of the world, our brothers and sisters in every place who are struggling in different ways. Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet to bring comfort, to bring hope, and to bring light. We pray for your creation, O oh Lord. Make us into faithful stewards of all life on earth that we might care for our home and planet and share responsibly in its resources. We pray on this day for the welfare of the city in which we live, for we know that our own welfare depends on seeking the welfare of others. Today, O oh Lord, we lift to you the cares we hold on this day in our hearts, the persons and the circumstances that we lifted to you, both those who, that we spoke aloud and those who remain unspoken deep within the recesses of our souls. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bring healing and hope comfort and peace. All that is needed in each circumstance is you stand in the gap for us. Lord, you have promised us a future filled with hope. Give us the faith we need to walk in your light, to live in your hope, 
to hold on to your joy and to know your peace. We entrust our prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray boldly together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our scripture reading on this day is from Jeremiah chapter 29, and we will be reading verse 1 and verse 4 through 14. This is the Common English Bible. The prophet Jeremiah sent a letter from Jerusalem to the few surviving elders among the exiles, to the priests and the prophets, and to all the people Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims to all the exiles I have carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Cultivate gardens and eat what they produce. Get married and have children. Then help your sons find wives and your daughters find husbands in order that they too may have children. Increase in number there so that you don't dwindle away. Promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because your welfare depends on its welfare. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, Don't let the prophets and diviners in your midst mislead you. Don't pay attention to your dreams. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I didn't send them, declares the Lord. The Lord proclaims, when Babylon's seventy years are up, I will come and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you search for me, yes, search for me with all your heart, you will find me. I will be present for you, declares the Lord, and I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you, and I will bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord. The story of God, for the covenant people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. These are your words, O God. Humble us to speak their weight, strengthen us to hear their truth, and bind us to live their call through the power of your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. May your word come through me or in spite of me. Amen. Move this a little bit. It keeps making noise. I'm so sorry. Today, as I mentioned, is the first Sunday of Advent. I can hardly believe that the year has gone by as quickly as it has, haven't you? Notice that time just seems to fly. Advent is a neat time. It's a time of expectant waiting and preparation. And we are, we are preparing to celebrate Jesus' birth once more, to celebrate the fact that God sent the Messiah into the world. But for us, who knows that he came, that he is always with us. We are also waiting for that promise that he made to come again. Waiting is hard, isn't it? Now, when I was a little kid, my parents used to help us wait. I know some of you probably did the same or had your parents do this for you. But um, they would take a calendar and they'd kind of circle the big day, right? And then every time you cross off a sleep until you only have a few more sleeps left until the big day comes. You know, you have like all those exits. It just helps you to wait when you have an end point in sight when you can see the end is near. It's much harder to wait, though, when you don't have a time limit, when you don't know quite how long it is that you are going to have to wait. I'm sure that many of you recognize that very familiar scripture verse contained in today's reading. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. 
They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. How many of you have not seen that on cross-stitch pillows, on mugs, on Bible um, bookmarks, on plaques? You know, it, it's saying that that little verse is really everywhere. I have even seen it in graduation cards, and I really love giving a student a graduation card with that verse in it. But what do these good plans of God for each of us, for peace and a hopeful future, mean when it is placed in the context of waiting, and not just waiting, but waiting in a place of deep exile? Now, the exiles who received this letter from Jeremiah, as they try to figure out what comes next in this strange place where they now find themselves, perhaps they were troubled to read that they would have to wait not just a little bit, but a really, really long time before they begin to go home. Now, the false prophets against whom Jeremiah speaks are people like Hananiah, who, who were telling the people, oh, Babylon is falling soon. In like two years, everyone's home and everything's back to normal. Of course, this was a far more popular message to hear, right? Who wouldn't want to hear that? We can easily see why people would rather hear that. Jeremiah tells the people the truth as he hears it from God. They would be in Babylon for much longer. In fact, about three and a half generations. That would mean that most of the people who left Jerusalem as adults would never see it again, and some of those who get to go home would have never laid eyes on this city in their entire lives. Now, Jeremiah needed for them to hear this message because they were not just to sit and wait passively until their exile ended. They were also not meant to put up a big resistance and make their life impossible and hard while they were there because that would jeopardize their safety. Instead, he urges them to listen to God, set down roots, make this place home. Pray for the welfare of this city, because your own welfare depends on it. Things went wrong, there would be no exiles to bring home. This must not have felt like very good news at all. How often do we find ourselves in places and situations where we feel like we are in exile, proverbial exile, of course, that's what I'm kind of getting at. When we find ourselves in the very last place that we want to be. To be pulled, to put down roots in the midst of that. And to live our best life in these circumstances kind of feels counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because that is the very last thing you want to do. Who would want to linger there? Yet this is the message that God sends to the people in Babylon. Jeremiah mentions God in two very important ways. He starts out by saying, the Lord of heavenly forces, this is the God of power and might. And then he says, the God of Israel, to remind the people that this almighty, powerful God is your God. That is the God who holds your life, who has those good plans for you, a future filled with hope, peace, and not disaster. God has not forgotten them. God has not abandoned them, and perhaps most importantly for the people to hear and to realize is that even in this faraway place, God is there. Psalm 137, verse 1 through 4, is a lament. A psalm written by some of the exiles, they say, who were finding themselves on the shores of the rivers of Babylon, and you know this um, passage well too. Alongside Babylon's streams, there we sat down, drying, because we cried, because we remembered Zion. We hung up our lyres in the trees there, because that's where our captors asked us to sing. Our tormentors asked us for songs of joy. Sing us a song about Zion, they said. But how could we possibly sing the Lord's song on foreign soil? Psalm ends with curses on Babylon. Prayer that Babylon would be repaid for the hardship that they paid on the people. But again, God's message to the exiles surprises. First of all, they can, in fact, sing the Lord's song even in this strange land. 
People should build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat its produce. They should get married and have children, raise them, let them get married. Watch their grandchildren and great-grandchildren grow. They should set down roots in this strange place and flourish right where they are. But the most shocking part of this entire message for the people would have been God's encouragement, not for revenge, but for seeking the welfare of the city and its people. Praying for their captors, praying for their enemies, because your future depends on its welfare. Now this was not a common prophetic message at all. You hardly ever heard anything like this coming from a prophet, where the prophet encourages the people to pray for their enemies and to, and to hold them safe, because this is what God is telling them to say. Maybe God did tell prophets to say these things, and they just couldn't bring the words across their lips, who knows? But this is not something we hear very often in the prophetic texts. In fact, it would be centuries before we heard similar words again and we know who those came from. Do you remember in Matthew 5, verse 44, what Jesus said? But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of the Father who is in heaven. This was the, one of the core messages of Jesus' teaching and ministry is to love your neighbors, all your neighbors, including your enemies. Don't seek their downfall. Don't seek revenge against them. But shockingly, friends, pray for them. Seek their welfare. God is essentially telling them to live and to thrive and hope and joy in the very last place they ever wanted to be. And more than that, rather than seeking the downfall of the place where they are, they are to live in ways that promote the well-being of the very people who brought them there against their will, because their well-being determines their own well-being. Not only is God everywhere, but God is the God of people everywhere. Now, what would happen in this strange land where people do not yet know God, when these exiles do exactly what, what they read in this letter, when they do set down roots and they kind of, you know, maintain their identity as the people of God, they, they live out their faith in ways that, that let others see who God is as they pray for their enemies and promote the welfare of the people among whom they live? Could it be that the people might just encounter God in this strange land? Is this not at the heart of the good news that we share, the gospel that we proclaim? And think of the, how the angels brought the good news. Wonderful, joyous news for all people that Jesus Christ was born. Or, or when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus in um, John 3, verse 16 through 17, and he says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. From the very beginning, the story of God and God's people, God had in mind to include all people, because you'll remember centuries before, when God made that covenant with Abraham, what did God say? All the families of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. These exiles would maintain their identity and their faith. They would live out their faith. They would work. They would pray for their enemies, for their Babylonian neighbors. And perhaps this would be an opportunity for their Babylonian neighbors to meet God, too. The God who is already there and who seeks their, their welfare as well. God's plans are not our plans. Since the people find themselves here in exile, which is definitely not part of their plan, God reminds them that God always and everywhere seeks our welfare, peace, and not disaster to give us that future filled with hope. This future that they have now may not quite have looked like the one they had planned out, right? Don't we make our plans? And then things happen and our plans look very different. But in being encouraged to settle in, to create and maintain community, and their identity here, so they can flourish and thrive, does indeed ensure a future for each of them. It allows them to live in hope, perhaps even to find unexpected joy in one of the most difficult times of their lives. 
to be sure and assured in their trust in God that God will keep all of God's promises. As they bloom where they are planted, they know that even here, surrounded by their enemies, God hears them when they pray. And when they seek God, they find God, because God is right there with them. The CB like, adds little, and many of our English translations actually, add little section titles to the different chapters of the Bible that the Hebrew Bible, I look to see what the Hebrew Bible might have in the original text. And they don't put section headings in these things, but I really like this, the, the common English Bible section heading for this letter to the exiles. It says, Disturbing Hope. Settle down in Babylon. The hope and offered in this passage certainly would be disturbing. Because it is not the news that we are want or expect to be told to, to, to live in this moment. But it is indeed hopeful because it is honest. It reminds them that they are not alone. And that since they cannot change the situation they are in, they just might find peace and joy when they discover ways to thrive within it, the seemingly impossible. Unexpected things come out of it all the time, don't they? Sometimes it's great stuff, right? We find out a new baby has been born, or ooh, a new job, a kid got into college, or, you know, hey, you won the lottery, woohoo! You know, like all kinds of good, unexpected things happen, and those things make us smile, those things make us kind of just sit back and, and, and relish those memories, I mean, just fondly think of those things. But sometimes the unexpected things that we find out are not so happy, even. Sometimes they are downright tragic. Sometimes it launches us into our own places of exile where we suddenly feel like those strangers in a strange land, finding ourselves in the very last place we ever wanted to be. So my question is, in those moments, in those times, can we draw encouragement from these words of Jeremiah. Can we do the unimaginable and find a way to accept the circumstances we are in, build our house there and settle in, finding ways to thrive even there? The important thing is too, and I think of the serenity prayer, I was like, really, I don't know why the serenity prayer kept popping up for me as I was working through these verses, but you, you know the serenity prayer, right? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's a very beautiful prayer. <clears throat> we can ask God for the patience and the endurance to recognize those circumstances in our lives that are beyond our control. And then, even in these out-of-control situations, there are parts of it that we can control. We can always control our attitude and how we, how we respond, what we do. There are things in our world that we certainly can and should change, and we can help pray to God to help us to recognize those things as well. When we see systems and things in the world that, you know, affect other people so that maybe they feel like their circumstances may never change, but we have the power to help to work together to change that poverty, oppression, discrimination, abuse, those kinds of things, then we certainly should stay, again, faithful and endure to make the changes that need to happen so that all people may thrive. Working and praying for the welfare of the city in which we live means that we work and pray for the welfare of all the people within it. Because on their well-being depends our own. God accomplishes God's incredible plans for peace and a hope-filled future of all God's beloved children in such unexpected and beautiful ways. Working for us through others, like on our behalf through other people, and through us on behalf of other people. It always kind of reciprocates, right? Sometimes God works through us, and sometimes God works for us through others, right? It's a beautiful thing to be a part of all that God is doing. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. I love these verses, and I want, to, I want us to really hear them again. 
Our plans may not be God's plans. And when our best plan laid plans don't work out quite the way we had hoped, we know that we can place our hope firmly in the Lord who hears our prayers, who is with us, even in those places of exile, who is present for us, and who has promised to bring us home. Can we wait on the Lord? Can we remember who and whose we are, making the most of every moment right where we are? Because it turns out that our future is not dependent on what happens tomorrow, but on what we do with today. As we wait throughout these days of Advent, as we wait for Jesus to return to us as he promised, as we wait for the kingdom to be what God intends it to be, well, friends, we wait in hope. We wait in peace, we wait in joy, and we wait in the light of God. And as we wait, may we bloom right where we are planted. Amen. Friends, now I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we sing hymn number 213, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Kings. <laughs> Amen and Amen. amen.